man and woman who is on this, uh, is joining us tonight on the Zoom call. We pray that you would bless our time, that you would open up our, our, our hearts and our ears uh, to what uh, we're about to hear, um, that you would call us, Lord, to respond in kind, that we would not just walk on by, but that we would think about and pray about the ways that we can assist those that are on the front lines, Lord. Uh, maybe we would assist with um, uh, through volunteering, perhaps it's through our advocacy, could be at our leadership level. However it is that you want to use us tonight, we just pray that you help us to really uh, see what you want us to see. And we thank you, Lord, for those that serve uh, vulnerable youth on the front lines. We pray, Jesus, you would protect them. We thank you for Tammy being with us. And I lastly pray, Lord, for uh, these most vulnerable children and youth in the state of Connecticut, that you, Father, we know you see them. We pray that you would help them um, come closer to the ones that can help them, the true helpers, Lord. And uh, yeah, we just hope, Lord, that you can um, rescue them as only you, as only you can do. Um, we thank you, Lord, for the night, and uh, we pray you be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I have the great privilege of uh, introducing to you uh, Tammy Sneed, who is the leader of our state in Connecticut. She um, is uh, the director of the Heart uh, Community, which is at the Department of Children and Family. Um, she has done incredible work. She's one of those collaborators, and she spearheads so many different relationships in the state to collectively respond to and the, the human trafficking that's happening in our state with a special attention to child trafficking. Um, she has many, many partnerships that she's formed and she is a national consultant. She educates communities across the United States um, and just helps people understand what, how you can respond to human trafficking. She also co-leads the Governor's Task Force on Justice for Abused Children, focusing on ensuring all child abuse victims receive appropriate services and supports and the full extent of what legal system can provide to these victims. She's a personal friend, um, and we are so incredibly grateful that she's here tonight. Please welcome Tammy Sneed. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie, and thank you, Lynn, and hello, everybody. Um, thank you for being here tonight. As you know, Anne Marie alluded to, um, you know, it's a tough topic when we start to think about what these kids have been through. Um, but I truly believe that us working all together, we truly can make a difference. Um, I'm going to talk tonight a little bit about trafficking in general, just to make sure we're all kind of grounded in what this looks like. What are some of the red flags we should be paying attention to for both labor and sex? And then I'm gonna dive into um, what are some of the additional vulnerabilities we're seeing for kids and adults um, regarding COVID-19? And what are some of those challenges and what are some of those things that we can do um, to try to keep our children safe, try to keep adults safe during their most vulnerable times? We know COVID has changed the way this world um, is at this point. We have lots of people out of work, lots of people um, in homes together, not being able to get out. There's lots of family pressure. Um, kids are very isolated. So that it's very trying times. And those kind of situations definitely increase victimization, both with domestic violence, with human trafficking, with child abuse, um, you know, the list goes on and on. So let's start. I'm going to, I do have a brief PowerPoint. I'll talk a lot, pretty much over it, but at least it'll be something you can see besides looking at my face all, all night tonight. Um, and it'll keep us kind of grounded in our discussion. All right. So again, to keep us very grounded in what this actually is, and it will also help us kind of frame our discussion in a few minutes. But when we look at trafficking um, across this country, the best definition we can use um, is the federal definition, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. And to really, really shortly summarize that, when we're looking at sex trafficking, we're looking at individuals performing sex acts for something of value. And when they're children, when they're under the age of 18, 
no matter what, whether there's force, fraud, or coercion or not, these kids are victims, all right? No adult has any right to buy sex from a child, all right? We don't let children drink. We don't let them um, smoke. We don't, we make them go to school. Uh, there's all kinds of restrictions. We certainly cannot let an adult buy sex from them. With labor trafficking, unfortunately, though, you do have to prove force, fraud, or coercion for both adults and children. But looking at both sex and labor and under, sex and labor trafficking and the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, it's really important to know that these victims have rights and their services and their supports out there for them. And a lot of individuals that are in the life that are experiencing this horrific crime, whether again, they're adults or children, they don't know there are extensive resources out there to help them. Um, and we can all be part of that. Like Anne Marie said, um, it's really about what we do as a state. It's not about any single person on this call today, including myself, including Anne Marie or Lynn. It's really about what we each can do um, to um, address trafficking in our state and across the country. So labor trafficking, it is a billion dollar industry. And we're looking at the numbers on, on here are even higher at this point. Right here it says 14.2 million people are trapped in forced labor. The recent numbers are bringing that close to anywhere from 18 to 22 million people. So it's astounding. And that includes the U.S. Um, many individuals are paying to get into the U.S. for safety, um, to you know, get jobs, to get away from um, horrible things where they're living from, and they're often being lured in by traffickers. They think they're paying a fee to get here, to be safe and sound, and in fact, they're often forced into labor trafficking situations. And our most vulnerable people are targeted. And again, think about COVID-19. We have so many people out of jobs right now. Families have to survive. That is definitely impacting folks. Um, in regards to what they're going to do to take care of their families, to take care of themselves. The types of labor trafficking, I'm not going to go into all of these in detail, but I will tell you all the ones highlighted in red are examples that we've seen across the state of Connecticut, and I'm sure there's more out there. Um, but again, these are because of the times, it just in general because of the times, many times these victims are not coming forward, particularly our undocumented individuals. We have many undocumented individuals in Connecticut being victimized. And when law enforcement operations attempt to recover them and to provide services, they are often extremely afraid and very resistant to give us any information. Uh, primarily because those traffickers are often threatening them, saying that they're gonna kill them, they're gonna kill their family, that they have somebody back in their home country, that if they don't do what they're supposed to do, they're gonna go kill that whole family in that other country. Um, there's, these are real threats people are fearful for. Um, so that is the reality of labor trafficking, and it's not just related to our immigration population. We have seen domestic cases as well. I have seen a lot of individuals with other vulnerabilities, such as drug um, and alcohol addiction. And lots of times they're getting pulled in. We're seeing a lot of the um, kind of the peddling and the begging. We often look at them as if they're individuals that need some money personally, um, come to find out through many of the operations and the, the um, individuals that are recovered, lots of times they're part of a ring. They are out there because they have to make money for their trafficker. Often that trafficker will give them some substance, um, but otherwise their conditions are deplorable and they're working crazy hours in horrible conditions trying to get money for that trafficker. Um, so we often look at things one way and what I found as we start to di dive deep into the sex and labor trafficking, it's often very different than what we're seeing. So, you know, pay attention to these areas and really think about individuals' vulnerabilities and what may bring them to these types of situations. Indicators of labor trafficking, and this is just to kind of arm you as you're out there and you're doing your things. Um, these individuals are typically paid very, very little, if anything. Um, when there's kids involved, they're not going to school, they don't have papers, they're working hours, they're not supposed to. Um, we see these individuals come with large debts. You know, they may come to the U.S. for $12,000, but then all of a sudden the traffickers charging them for rent and they're living in an abandoned building. 
and food. Uh, and those bills never go anywhere. Um, they're often not in control of their money. When these individuals, whether we're talking a panhandling ring or we're talking a group of individuals that are doing housekeeping at one of the hotels under a contract, once they're done with that job, that money goes to their trafficker. So paying attention to those kind of, kind of issues um, are really, really helpful um, in trying to identify what's going on. Sex trafficking, all right, so labor, pay attention to what people are getting, kind of hours they're working, conditions they're working in, are they sleeping where they're working? And now let's look at sex trafficking. Um, primarily the cases we have seen in Connecticut are domestic. And what we mean by domestic um, in regards to sex trafficking, we're talking about, again, the exchange of any sex act for anything of value, but for a child under the age of 18, who's either a US citizen or a permanent resident. So again, it's that sex act for something of value, the child's under the age of 18, uh, and they must be a US citizen or permanent resident. So the vast majority of our cases have been such. Doesn't mean we do not have undocumented victims. It just means the cases that are coming forward to us are, do are domestic. Many times victims, um, immigrants um, that are victims of trafficking are not willing to come forward. Again, for that same dynamic. We see that playing out in the massage parlors very regularly. When people go in there to try to help, they're very, very fearful, fearful to disclose. So they're not hitting our data points. Um, I'd like to point out the map up here, and that is from Polaris Project, which is our national hotline. And these are where majority of their calls come in. And it doesn't mean there's, there's no activity in the center of the state. Sometimes it's because there's more efforts focusing on sex trafficking in these other states. But I'd like to highlight that red section on the right-hand side, that entire East Coast. And Connecticut and New York um, and Boston are in deep red. Um, so we are definitely a hot spot in this country. Um, in regards to child cases of sex trafficking, we are averaging about 200 cases per year. The majority of these kids are girls. Um, I will tell you though, boys um, account for about 30% of the victims across the country um, in any given year. So we're under, -identify, under identifying boys right now. So we're trying to really learn about what to look at for boys so we can start to identify them. We know they're being victimized. We're not looking at the right places. We're not asking the right questions. We don't have the right services. Whatever reason, we're pushing that population away and we have to look at it. Um, and then our transgender population. Our transgender population numbers are higher. Many times that's not being captured in our data. But then the, also the other challenge is lots of times these kids are being ejected from their communities and they have to survive. Um, so they're very quickly pulled into the life. Um, so again, 200 cases per year. Um, the types of child sex trafficking, um, all of the above, but I want you to pay attention to that top one, the internet base. The vast majority of our kids are groomed on the internet and sold on the internet. This is a very high profit, low risk industry. These kids um, often are groomed and their dates are set up on the internet. They go to a lo location, they um, do what they're supposed to do for their trafficker and they meet that trafficker later. So if anybody is trying to do an operation to go after that trafficker, most of the time there's a distance between that victim and that trafficker, all right? So internet makes this very, very safe for traffickers. Um, so they don't wanna be arrested, but there's certainly a whole lot of money in here. And this is one of the biggest factors we're gonna talk about in a couple of minutes in regards to COVID, all right? always has been an um, issue on the internet, but we are seeing increased grooming right now during times of COVID. The rest of the areas go without say, um, but I do also wanna point out, going down a little bit further into familial. So that's when a parent, guardian, or entrusted caregiver is victimizing a child. And the other challenge for us right now is um, we don't have kids in school. Schools report at least half of our cases to the Department of Children and Families for abuse and neglect on an annual basis. That number has plummeted. Because these kids are in school, there's not eyes on them. They're not out in the community. They're not with their mentors. They're not with their, their peers. They're not with their peers' friends and their, friend and their family. 
Um, so they're really flying under the radar right now, which is really scary. And we're seeing that in regards to all types of abuse across the country right now. And then survival sex and sex for drugs. All right. Individuals, both kids and adults, often will engage in the life to survive. Um, and we have seen that both, again, with both with adults, kids, girls, boys, men, women. Um, it, it knows no bounds. And then also in regards to sex for drugs. It's interesting when we watch COVID um, over the last several months, the amount of alcohol consumption, all right, the sales for alcohol has skyrocketed. People are drinking more. Drinking leads to other things. I'm not, I'm not saying nobody drinks. I shouldn't drink. You shouldn't drink. All right. You know, I, I'm one for a nice glass of wine, but really paying attention to how this could impact a family and impact the child that's in that family. Um, things definitely happen as we start to see those types of increases. So this is a really, um, it's a really awesome two and a half minute kind of public service announcement and it's designed for kids and the reason i wanted to show you this tonight is because this is what we see we see kids being groomed um, by the internet and they are so confident they know that person all right kids are naive they're very very vulnerable um, i'm not going to go into brain development but not until an individual gets into their mid to late 20s do they have that full brain development and are able to take a look at some of those risks. Um, so these kids, just because they're an adolescent, are at risk, and then you add additional risk factors such as family struggles, parents without jobs, not being in school, it increases the risk factors. So when we look at how these kids are brought in, so extortion and online enticement is huge, right? And we know that the vast majority of these kids are female, the vast majority of the offenders are male, and most of these um, offenders, we have no idea who they are, all right? They are not known to the victim. So it's not typically like an interfamilial type situation. So I just wanna show you this really clip, quick clip, because um, I think it is helpful and we do use it when we educate kids. So I will try it. Sometimes I have issues with it, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Hi Zach, there's another video from my special guy. I can't believe we haven't talked all day. I wish you went to my school or work closer so we could finally meet. I could have been on an hour. Don't spend too long on the phone. Okay. All right. It's not going to work. For some reason, it plays beautifully with um, when I don't have it on Zoom, but when it's on Zoom, it automatically slows it down. It is something you can pull up online. I can even give the link to Lynn, so people that want to watch it. Um, but basically what it shows is a girl that supposedly is in love with this cute boy, you know, a little blonde boy, um, and they're developing this relationship and she decides she, you know, she's gonna give him a little treat and show him in, in her bra. Um, pretty common with kids nowadays, unfortunately. She does it, and then after she does that, he asks for more, and she basically is trying to tell him no, and he starts to threaten her. If you don't do it, I'm gonna send what you sent me to all your friends, to your family. Um, and we see this type of blackmail happen to these kids very regularly. And it, they don't just keep it at the videos. Eventually, they're threatened to come meet with them. And we've seen it happen. They often threaten to hurt the family, They'll threaten to hurt the kid. They'll threaten to hurt siblings. So kids are super vulnerable on the internet. And these bad actors are finding ways to connect to these kids that are super innocent, that really believe that that cute little picture um, that's tagged with that boy's um, face is him. And, it, and it's not. Um, you can definitely see who this creepy individual is when you watch this video. So, and then the other thing we have to pay attention to is just understanding social media. Um, so kids have been um, groomed by the internet, but we're also seeing kids groomed through various apps and we're seeing kids get groomed through gaming systems. Kids, you know, kids nowadays have, you know, that option to talk to people across the country to engage in those conversations. We had a young lady that engaged with a boy that she thought um, in another country um, and she was at the airport to fly overseas to meet this person 
Um, and we were fortunate enough to have law enforcement um, arrive in time so she didn't get out on that flight. Um, he is a trafficker in another country and he's been trying to pull kids from the United States. Um, and they met on a gaming system, having those conversations and then, you know, say, hey, you know, I, I, you look really bummed out tonight or you sound really bummed out tonight, you want to talk and let's connect over on this app um, and developing that relationship. And this kid is thinking this is like the, the best person they've ever met. This person really gets them. This person loves them. All of those dynamics and lo and behold, um, it is a bad actor trying to exploit that child. Um, and it's not just for trafficking. I want you all to, to remember that um, lots of it's for trafficking, but some of it is pedophiles trying to get a hold of our kids. Um, so no matter what way you're looking at it, it's, it's for no good. So the red flags, you know, think about these. There's two pages of them. I'm not going to dive into great detail because I want to get into some of the COVID things. But, you know, know your kids. Too many times nowadays we don't know our neighbors. Um, we're not as close to our nieces and nephews anymore because sister works really hard, hard tons of hours. I work really hard tons of hours. So we're not connecting to our nieces and nephews. Um, so those dynamics play out when we're not paying attention to what's going on with our kids. Um, pay attention to what kids have. You know, when kids have things that they don't have the means to have or that family doesn't have the means to have, get worried. I, you know, something is up with them. Pay attention to how they're dressed, any injuries they may have, um, any kind of bruises. Are, is their, their mood, their personality changing? Are they more depressed? Are they more anxious? Are they angry? Um, are they losing weight? Um, do they look like they haven't slept in days? There's all kinds of indicators. And it doesn't just mean, you know, you see a kid and all of a sudden she has these new shoes that um, she said her friend gave her um, and she, she looks like she lost 10 pounds. It doesn't necessarily mean she's a victim of trafficking. It just means that these are red flags and we should be paying attention to, to them. And sometimes they are victims of trafficking. Um, so, you know, pay attention to these. Um, Lynn can have this PowerPoint too. Everybody can have it. Um, so you kind of have this list for your, yourself, you know, moving forward um, for, you know, any kind of discussions or any type of work you do, depending on what area you're in, depending on your family, maybe you share it with your sister or, you know, the grandma of the family, whatever, you know, share it and really start to think about what are some of the signs out there that we should pay attention to. Um, and tattoos are a biggie. Um, I've had probably six cases in the last week and there were been pretty big, um, horrible cases and all of them had a unique tattoo um, within that particular network of victims. So kids that you start to see having those same type of tattoos or tattoos that the kid's not willing and ready to talk to you about, I'd get a little bit worried. And I'm not telling you to go up and say, why, why did you get that tattoo? It looks terrible. Um, you know, I'm saying, ask them. You know, what's that tattoo mean? If kids, kids typically will tell you, all right? It usually has some sort of meaning, but if they don't want to tell you, I'd be worried about it, okay? So the traffickers, I'm just briefly mentioning this because we, you know, obviously we wouldn't have victims if we don't have traffickers and anyone can be a trafficker. And again, think about COVID, all right? We have kids at home, all right? We have kids staying with their family many more hours than normal, all right? These kids aren't going to school. They're not playing sports right now. They're with their families. So anyone can be a trafficker, all right? We have to pay attention to that detail um, for these kids. What I also wanna share here is many of our kids, you know, we talked about the forced fraud and coercion with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. We don't need this for sex trafficking of kids. If they're under the age of 18, they're being bought for sex, they're victims. But fraud is typically what we see, all right? We see false sense of relationships. We see the girlfriend. I have a case right now where I have a 23-year-old girl that's been grooming a 15-year-old girl. Um, and there's a trafficker over the 23-year-old girl. Um, we have had jobs, you know, people, individuals thinking they're going to get a job, maybe selling magazines and lured into labor trafficking. We're watching one of those cases right now. Um, but boyfriend scenarios, huge modeling companies, some sort of relationship that gets that kid invested and pulls them in. Again, super vulnerable, super naive. Who buys sex? All right, let's 
put this clearly out there, we would not have victims, we would not have traffickers if we didn't have such a huge demand to buy sex from kids. We have done operations where ads have been posted of kids, fake ads by law enforcement for kids, and we've gotten 50,000 responses in a few days. All right, so the demand is high. The reality is this has been normalized. This is not new. All right, this has been around for a lot of years. Um, lots of men, particularly when they have done some surveys and also done some interviews, it's kind of a rite of passage for them to buy sex at least one time in their life. But we do know the majority of buyers are regular buyers, at least 75% of that population. Um, we know that most of them make a good amount of money. All right, you're looking at individuals that make at least $100,000 a year. Um, and the reality is, um, only about 6% of these men ever get arrested for their crime. And there's lots of discussions about laws, and I know under, the underground does a good job of keeping everybody um, notified when these pieces of legislation come on board. But pay attention to that, because we really have to do some changes here. So let's tie this together, all right? We talked about sex and labor trafficking. We talked about vulnerabilities in general. We talked about the internet being the number one way kids are lured into the trafficking and also how they're sold um, for trafficking. Again, keeping that barrier for that trafficker. So with COVID, we have increased risk factors, all right? We have decreased reporting. I can't tell you, the no we went down like 80% in numbers of reports and that has been across the country, all right? People stopped reporting and it's not because kids aren't being abused, it's because Kids, uh, individuals, adults are not getting their eyes on these kids to make those reports. So super important. Um, remote learning, all right. I learned today, I didn't know this data, but it was pretty astounding. It looks like about 30% of our kids did not sign on to online learning in Connecticut during the last three months of the last school year when COVID kicked in. So that's a whole lot of kids that aren't even getting looked at or checked in on, on the school computer um, out there, nobody knows what they're doing. And that's what's really scary. And a lot of factors play into that. And, you know, I, I can go on that um, rampage as well. But the reality here is we're not seeing these children. These kids have increased internet usage. We have had, a, honestly, I've had several cases of kids that never had technology now have technology and have been groomed online and not all for sex trafficking. Some of them have been pedophiles trying to get to these kids, um, threatening these kids if they don't send pictures, they're gonna kill their, fam their parents, their family. Um, but that is happening at an alarming rate. And then lots of times those types of situations do turn into trafficking. New technology, kids get this new stuff and they're excited and they don't know how to use it. And that's the other reason we have to push education in regards to technology. And I'll mention that in a minute. Um, family tension, parental distractions, home alone, parents have to work. Kids aren't in school. Many parents still have to go to work and lots of these kids are being left at home alone. All right, super high risk factor. And then substance abuse, um, use, both with the child and or the parent. All right, it's increasing during COVID. Lots of people are depressed and feeling isolated. For, for adults, they too, huge risk factors um, to increase their vulnerabilities um, during COVID. One is housing insecurities. We've seen cases of extortion for rent. Um, landlords saying you have sex with me or you let me have sex with your daughter, your rent is free. Food insecurity, survival. Families have to feed their children. Sometimes children are working to feed the families. Individuals losing their jobs, all right? Sometimes, yes, there's some unemployment benefits that were um, increased that were helpful for folks, but it doesn't make that person feel any better about themselves. So all those kind of things impact that family. And again, substance abuse. So what we're seeing, online grooming, fraudulent relationships, children running away from home, often related to um, family challenges, um, and children often supporting fam family financially. All of these risk factors are contributing to kids being victimized during COVID. Now, we don't have the clear data, all right? I have lots of individual cases we're looking at, but we don't have the clear data. I looked at some of Polaris data, and 
there's indicators that there's the risk factors have increased about 40 percent but again that data clearly articulating it it's um, because of the uh, results of COVID is not there um, but I think we can pretty much assume that what can we do all right we only got about three four more minutes um, first and foremost we have to provide education all right we heart has tons of education um, we have education for um, just about every kind of profession you can think about um, we have to train on human trafficking. We have to train on internet safety, on apps, on gaming systems, et cetera. And we have to get this information to children, parents, caregivers, teachers, communities. All right. Kids know computers, kids know phones. Often us, we as parents do not. I will tell you my grandkids can use my phone much better than I can use. So we have to arm ourselves. We have to try to stay ahead of them. Um, we do have an internet safety training for parents on Monday, the 19th, um, at six o'clock. And I know Lynn has that flyer and so does Anne Marie. Um, we still have quite a few slots available. Um, it's a great training. It's really to educate parents on what to pay attention to. Um, it gives you a resource guide. There's um, additional resources that'll be shared that you can, can tell you how to do some parental blocks and so forth. So really important stuff. We have to arm ourselves because those um, perpetrators, those bad actors are very armed. They know what they're doing. Kids have to know. Kids have no idea what is happening to them until it's too late. We have a training for kids on um, Tuesday, the 20th, six o'clock. Um, parents can attend with them. Kids have to be ages 12 and up. Um, but again, teaching kids about the dangers of online, of certain apps, um, in regards to sharing your information across the internet, so forth and so on. So we have to educate the kids and those trainings are free. Please use them. Um, I'm seeing a number of other trainings popping up. Those are super important. We have to monitor what our kids are doing online. Um, the apps they're using, some of them they're using and parents are thinking there's nothing wrong with it because they don't know what the app is. And lo and behold, it's a dating website that's being used for trafficking. Um, pretty scary stuff but we have to understand it and then games we have to understand the risks of these kids on these gaming systems um, utilize home common spaces while the child is learning exploring and gaming we have to keep kids um, with us uh, we don't want to like smother them but we have to be engaging these kids we can't have them in their room from eight in the morning until six at night finishing school and then them doing homework when in fact they're doing other things that kids normally do it's huge. Uh, we have to listen and learn about the kids' friends. Even if these are friends that these kids are meeting online, we have to talk to them. We, we need to know where they go to school, who are their parents. We have to be parents. And I know kids get frustrated when we do that, but if we don't understand who these kids are hanging out with, they are super at risk of being vulnerable to trafficking. Uh, and it takes the village. So if you have a parent in your community and you know that parent has to work, and that child is having to be homeschooled because of COVID, is there a way that you can provide support to that kid? Is there a way families can take turns? You know, say, hey, I'll take the three kids on Monday and Wednesday and help them out, and such and such will take the kids on Tuesday and Thursday. We have to find ways to help each other um, during these really tough times because families need to work, families need to eat, kids need to learn, and we have to keep them safe. Right, all super important. And then I always end um, with this really important um, message, and that is if you ever think there's a kid under the age of 18 that's a victim of trafficking, please call DCF. If it's an emergency, if that child is at imminent risk or you are at imminent risk, please call 911. All right, DCF's not 911. But if you think there's a kid that um, you think is possibly a victim, you don't have to prove it call us all right i review every single report and i respond to every single report um, so super super important um, for you to do that so that's my presentation it's really about all of us working together during covid realizing that there are so many people that are have increased vulnerabilities some families that were already very vulnerable are now you know homeless and jobless and foodless 
Um, and until we kind of all come together to pay attention to what's happening to our neighbors, we're going to continue to see this happening. Lynn, Anne Marie? Yeah. So now we're going to have um, Anne Marie share a little bit about what the underground has been doing and um, how you can get involved in the underground. If Tammy, you would stop your screen share and we can get Anne Marie up on the screen. Hello. Can you see me okay, Lynn? Very good. Well, I mean, that was excellent presentation, Tammy, and so informative. Um, a lot of good information there. I, and um, Lynn just put up there that the link's going out on the training next week as a follow-up, which is wonderful. And we would highly encourage all the participants tonight to consider joining one, either Monday or Tuesday, uh, the internet safety training. You won't regret it. And it'll help your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, nephews, your friends, your neighbors. Uh, you can really do a lot with that kind of training in passing the word on. And um, so just a few minutes about the underground and what we're about. Um, our main purpose is to gather the churches of Connecticut and engage them in the anti-trafficking message and call them to pray, certainly. And then hopefully even uh, for those that care to, we provide volunteer opportunities. Um, what we're seeing with COVID, uh, because we have a lot of boots on the ground, along with uh, several providers in the state, especially with young adults because of COVID, as Tammy mentioned, there's a lot of job insecurity and uh, folks have lost their, their positions. Um, they need, uh, we have assisted with rent, we have assisted with uh, utility bills. We have assisted with food, just to keep them, you know, from selling themselves. Frankly, um, we're working with probably 15 people in the Greater Hartford area right now, just trying to help them um, get through this season. And uh, they're doing really well. And fortunately, they're staying free. And that's part of what the church does when we're when we're working with young adults. When it comes to um, the youth in our state, uh, Tammy was talking a lot about prevention, but unfortunately there are some youth that have experienced being exploited. Uh, we know that by the numbers. And so we have always tried to provide assistance and help where we can, where it makes sense in practical ways. So I just talked about some of the ways we help young adults in practical ways. We also do that for our youth through school supplies. Um, we have a back to school backpack program. Um, St. Peter's actually of West Hartford participated uh, this year and um, they helped uh, serve the Hartford uh, territory with back to school backpacks, which we're very grateful for. Um, we've provided the greater Hartford area with emergency uh, backpacks so that when the police departments, our local law enforcement is working with youth and uh, even young adults, they will share these backpacks with them that have all kinds of uh, products that will help them if, you know, even in the most practical ways again, and also provide them with hotline numbers so that if they need help, they can access help. That's a big piece of what the underground and the churches have been about over the past five years or so since 2014. We put out over 100,000 pieces, of either hotline bracelets or hotline cards so that the frontline workers can distribute those and make sure that kids that are vulnerable have the information that they need in order to get help. And along those lines, we love when our churches are willing to do some volunteer work in getting a signage out regarding the Polaris hotline, the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Um, it's mandated in our state. Various industries and businesses have to post these signs. And so we train teams, and lots of times these teams come from the churches, to go to different businesses and share these signs with them and ask them to post them. We have a whole program around that. We equip our volunteers. So if you are interested in getting more involved in spreading awareness beyond your lips, you know, and leaving some hotline posters behind, we would love to get you in, engaged in that. 
Um, there's plenty of outreach opportunities, which you can learn more about if, if you're interested by contacting the underground or even getting in touch with Lynn Campbell. Uh, we're fortunate to see two new um, transitional houses coming to Connecticut. Um, one is faith-based. Well, they both are, frankly. Um, one's located in Bridgeport, the other in the greater Hartford area. Amira will be in the greater Hartford area, and there's plenty of volunteer opportunities there. Um, we know that, you know, as the kids, as children and youth age out of the system, um, you know, just because they turn 18 doesn't make them any less of a victim. And some of these houses will help them transition into a life that's, you know, brand new. Frankly, we, we try to retrain people uh, in these houses and even, you know, give them a lot of therapy, a lot of care. And they, they're typically a two-year program. So at any rate, if you'd like to be one of the volunteers that helps these homes, you can, again, contact me, contact Lynn. Um, just a couple of good things that the underground's doing, and we do this all through donations. Whenever we receive a donation, 100%, 100% goes to uh, the victims and survivors and, and anything that has to do with awareness. Um, so all of it goes into the field. We have supported um, the youth and uh, of uh, the Department of Children and Families with a few enrichment scholarships. Um, we just heard from a young boy's mom. He's been taking horseback riding lessons uh, for about eight months. And some might think that that's frivolous, but for this young boy, he's actually turned around. And, you know, he was, he was terribly hurt. Um, and now he's able to work. He's able to, um, he's just feeling much better. She says he's happier. He's less depressed. He's he's moving on with his life and she she credits that to these lessons and his ability to be with with the horses and this various team that's been working with them and we've supported that as the church and we're happy to do things like that these enrichment scholarships you know they are not so practical necessarily we look for if a if a young person wants to try an art lesson we want to help them with that if they want to uh, get into music lessons. We want to help them with that. If they want to do special, I don't know, karate, we've helped some with that. Uh, we've even done some micro businesses in the past. And so really there's no end to the support that we can give. We try to be creative about the support that we do as the church. Um, and, uh, you know, we would encourage you to, to, to get involved if you feel led to. Um, I think that gives you an overview. Um, one thing that I'd like to do before I run is invite you to join our newsletter, which comes out periodically. Um, our newsletters uh, talk about awareness events that are happening throughout the state. They offer training. Um, if in case you would like to learn how to uh, speak, we, we would love to train you on this topic. Uh, the volunteering that we need is noted on those newsletters and advocacy when there's new laws that are coming out. And lastly, we report on news of arrests and rescues. So uh, if you'd like to be part of our newsletter, again, you can contact me or Lynn Campbell. We'd love to get you connected. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. We are, are so fortunate to have in Connecticut um, the underground and the great work that you do. Um, so I have a, a few questions that came up. Um, well, the first question has to do just with logistics of the training on Monday night in regards to is it open to just Connecticut residents, is it free, and the time for the child presentation. Sure. So there's a training on Monday for parents. That one is at 6 p.m. Um, you know, it's not restricted to outside Connecticut, but we primarily um, developed this and paid funded for it to get our Connecticut parents and teachers. Um, but if there's a person outside of Connecticut that would benefit, sure, absolutely. But I wouldn't disseminate it for schools out of Connecticut to join. Um, for the kids, it's on Tuesday. That's also at 6 p.m. That's from 6 to 7. So parents is an hour and a half. Kids is one hour. Um, kids have to be 12 and up and parents can and are encouraged to join with their kids. So the, the parent one, you're going to get lots of inside tips that we don't want the kids to hear. So it's really just for parents. The one for the kids 
it's always great to have parents and kids learning together. Um, so you're welcome to both. Um, and they are, again, they're free until we meet our max capacity. Great, thank you. Um, and another question came in in regards to, I think it's labor trafficking. So Tammy, you had mentioned about beg begging and um, we seem to be seeing a lot more of that in Connecticut these days. And you could just speak a little bit towards that. Sure, you know, um, some individuals that are begging are doing it because individually they are struggling and they need the money um, for whatever reason it may be. But we are seeing an uptick in rings regarding begging. We have seen a ring that was having women and kids um, begging for money at a shopping center. Uh, and, you know, we all know if we see a mom and a child, especially if the child's not dressed in a coat and it's freezing cold, we're much more apt to be able to provide something. Um, so those traffickers, that's what they were doing. And they were taking the money and all the women and the kids were undocumented. Um, so, you know, it's just because you see begging, it doesn't mean it's trafficking, but it's worth paying attention to. And there's a number of areas that are being currently being observed by law enforcement. Okay. I guess that was the follow-up question is what, um, what is law enforcement doing during these COVID times? Yeah, no, they're definitely still watching. Um, you know, it, the, the challenge is obviously COVID has changed kind of how we all have done our work um, and investigations and you name it. So I think for a period of time, we saw a lot of people just kind of, you know, close in and not move forward a lot. But overall, what I'm seeing right now is people are working really hard to address everything from child abuse to, to the trafficking, to the drugs. People are out there, they're working now. Um, you know, they don't feel, they don't seem to feel so stifled and, you know, kind of where they can't actually get out there. So things are happening. It's good to see. I can't always tell you what's happening, but things are happening. It's nice to see. That's good to know. Um, a question came in about uh, wearing masks and, and, and has that impeded um, identifying children or identifying traffickers because we're all wearing masks these days? No, not at all. Um, you know, typically uh, when these kids are out there, um, they're out there in front of us every single day. It doesn't matter if they have a mask in front uh, on them or not. There's manipulation that are going on that are it kind of that's taking these kids and putting them in the hands of the traffickers. It's not those situations where you have kids being pulled, you know, into that white van and um, you know they're they're trying to hide that child out. It doesn't work that way. Um, we have lots of victims that um, are living at home at time of victimization, 60%. Remember I told you 60% of these kids are living at home at time of victimization. Parents have no idea what's going on. So masks really don't, you know, doesn't matter in, in either direction. Okay. Good questions. <laughs> and, and Linda asked, we see red signs, but are there signals that are commonly used to indicate that an individual needs help, a way someone might be able to let us know that they need help? There's not. So what we do when we educate kids, we talk to them about numbers they can call. We teach them that when they're ready to get away to get rid of a cell phone that the trafficker gave them so they can't be tracked until law enforcement can get to them. Um, there, there really isn't. It's about us as a community being open to it and paying attention. We, I mean, how many people know all their neighbors in their community? It's not the same anymore. So if we start all paying attention to, I think kids will be much more apt to come to us when they're ready for help. They're not always ready for a while, but when they're ready for help. Right. Right. Um, uh, I think one last, again, question about the training is uh, someone asked about college students. I would assume they would take the adult class or sure. Yeah, 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 probably the adult class would be good. Okay. Um, uh, in regards to college students, college students have an opportunity to educate younger kids. You know, they're able to connect to our 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds much easier than us adults can. Um, so it's always good when college students are educated and they use kind of their position being in a college, being focused on a career to educate other kids. Um, so it's always nice to see college students involved. Any, uh, any final remarks you would, either one of you would like to share with us? 
you know, I just want to reiterate um, what the underground has done. Um, they really provide an enormous amount of resource to us. Everything from simply providing a training to churches and communities to um, finding the funds for us to get kids ready to go to school, to give them some of those opportunities to have the kids feel normal and feel connected to something that's something they haven't experienced before. So, you know, pet therapy, lots of times people look down at it and say, you know, well, we really need to get this kid in regular therapy. These kids are often not re ready for that regular therapy. Putting these kids with a horse, with a, um, a dog, um, with these pets make a world of difference. And those are things we can't fund. Um, so, you know, the fact that the underground can do all these unique things that often state funding organizations can't do has made a world of difference for these kids. So I encourage everybody to, you know, think about what you can do, um, whether it's just educating, you know, your sister or talking to your niece or joining the underground and doing some good things with them. Thanks, Tammy. And I just want to say how grateful we are to Tammy's leadership in our state. Um, really, I was on a call today with the Lieutenant Governor and, you know, she opened up that meeting. And the fact that we have Tammy Sneed um, as our state expert, who is a national expert, who continues to lead this initiative, the initiatives of the state, I should say, in a very broad way, bringing people together at that heart table it's just astounding what she's accomplished in just a few short years. So we're very blessed to have you, Tammy. And, uh, and Lynn, uh, really, the work that you're doing with the uh, Greater Hartford Churches, the Archdiocese of Hartford, is, is extraordinary. And we're also deeply blessed to have you in leadership here. So I, we, all of us together, it makes a difference. And I'm so glad to have two groups two girlfriends like you. <laughs> it's wonderful. And, uh, you know, it, it is a tough conversation, but there's still, there's still plenty of reason to have hope and we can change this. We really can together. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we're always looking for a next step. If you just go and talk to your sister, your neighbor, your daughter, your granddaughter, um, that, that's just so important. So as I said on the chat, I will send a recording of this event. Um, Tammy, if you send me that little video, we will also include that, and as well as information about the training on Monday. And you should be all set, but you also know that you can always reach out to Anne Marie at the Underground or myself at the Office for Social Justice. So thank you again, Tammy, for being with us this evening. Thank you. And thank you to all our attendees for joining us tonight. Have a good night. You good too. night. Thanks, good everyone. Bye-bye. Stay Bye. safe.